ten sequels. But in the can, you are spreading the disease. Yeah. How many drugs on you? Go me, gringo. Oh, he's out of control. I don't it's know. already Henry. So help me, Dr. Henry, you yell like that again. <laughs> George Lucas is my idol. I mean, if you asked who my inspiration was for wanting to get into filmmaking and having an interest in film, uh, he would be at the top of my list. It's very arguable that no other filmmaker has really had more a greater influence on, on uh, modern filmmaking than George Lucas. When it comes to filming on digital mediums like high definition and 4K, to nonlinear editing systems, digital special effects, I mean, let's face it, Filmmaking today has become much more accessible to aspiring filmmakers, and it's all because of a lot of the innovations that Lucas made. Now, of course, to most people, he's also the guy that created Star Wars. He created the adventures of Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, and Han Solo. It's arguable that without that film, a lot of people wouldn't even know who George Lucas was. Now, everyone knows that George Lucas attended the film program at USC. He directed several short films there until he w won the Best uh, Student Film Award for his short film, Electronic Labyrinth, THX 11384EB. Now, people today complain about long titles, but with a title like that, Electronic Labyrinth, THX 11384EB, audiences back then had no idea what kind of movie this was. At least with something like Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, or Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, people kind of have an idea of what they're going into. Now, the film was a futuristic take on George Orwell's 1984, and like in the book, in this film, the society is underground, it's heavily medicated, and it's governed by this all-empowering yet invisible Big Brother society where it just feels like there's one big entity watching everything you do. Lucas was interested in doing a semi-futuristic film that was a parable on the way people were living back then in the 1970s, which is an intriguing concept and one that works today because today the same thing really applies and it's, you know, 10 times worse because we're all, like, everybody is just so in tune to their electronic devices that a lot of the times we forget to live our everyday normal lives and to see what's really out there in the world. It's a really scary concept and one that works even better today. So it's 1971, and after Lucas won a lot of uh, recognition and awards for his film at film school, Francis Ford Coppola, who'd become a close friend of his at this time, uh, offered to help Lucas make the short film into a feature film. Warner Brothers, who actually distributed THX 1138, gave Francis Ford Coppola um, a bunch of money to basically produce seven films, but once THX 1138 was finished, the feature version of it, um, they looked at it and they, they didn't know what to make of it, and they actually asked that American Zoetrope return the money that they originally invested to create THX in future films, which was the major reason why Lucas was forced to leave American Zoetrope and eventually create Lucasfilm. Now, Lucas has always been really vocal about his um, experiences with big Hollywood studios. He's always wanted to um, be independent from the Hollywood studio system, and this film is one of those reasons why he feels that way. When he gave the, the film to Warner Brothers, they felt that they should have an ed another editor come in against Lucas's permission and cut out, like, a bunch of footage from the film um, and, and jury-rig it, even though they really didn't even understand what the film was about. So Lucas um, was not interested in mainstream storytelling. So when you look at the fact that he did Star Wars and that Star Wars was actually a big hit, that was almost a mistake because Lucas really had no interest in doing that kind of filmmaking. This is not the most narratively sound film, meaning it doesn't really have a beginning, middle, and end in a traditional sense. The way it's set up is... It's more about giving you an experience and a feeling. Lucas, more than a lot of modern day filmmakers especially, really understands the language of film and uses that to this movie's advantage. So even though the story isn't always the easiest to understand, he does a lot with the cinematography, the way to place the camera. I mean, this film is very epic with very minimal locations and sets. And it looks like a real location, very much like in the Star Wars films, the original trilogy anyway. Everything in this film looks real and used and beaten down like it could actually belong to an actual existing society. However, 
If you're looking to see where a lot of those images from A New Hope came from, look no further because there are a lot of visual similarities between this film and the original Star Wars film. Uh, for example, there's a lot of white backgrounds, just contrasty black figures against white backdrops. It's almost like this film could have taken place entirely on Tana 4, the Death Star. In fact, I have a lot of fun watching this movie and feeling like, especially in the detention area scenes in THX, when it's all the, the white backgrounds and everything, and it's like everything goes off to infinity, I have a lot of fun picturing like Darth Vader being behind these walls. Uh, we have these uh, chrome-faced uh, robotic cops that are kind of like the law enforcers in this movie. They could have been the precursor to the stormtroopers. In fact, you could theorize that these are just another faction of the Empire that we haven't seen yet in a Star Wars film. I mean, this could have been some kind of experiment. This could be like the Cloverfield of the Star Wars series, where it's like a side movie that is this whole other genre, but it could actually take place within the galaxy galaxy of Star Wars. Um, also, at the end of the film, when Robert Duvall's character, THX, escapes and he, he rises up the ladder and goes into the real world, he's looking into a sunset. It's not a binary sunset, but hey, for all we know, he could be getting off on the surface of Tatooine and maybe the second sun hasn't risen yet. Who knows? All joking aside, taking Star Wars out of the equation, THX-1138 follows Robert Duvall's character, THX-1138, who's an assembly line worker and who lives with his mate, LUH-3417. Like in Lucas' student film, the society here is underground, they're governed by this big brother, the law enforcers are these robotic cops, as I mentioned earlier, that look really cool, even though they're a very simple design. Um, they're heavily medicated, and everybody goes about their mundane tasks um, not really questioning why they're doing it. The opening of the film uh, is very surreal. Most of the film is surreal, but the opening of the film, um, there's the structure is all over the place. It's all about getting you to feel a certain way. Um, all you're really hearing, you're hearing sounds of workers talking to each other through radio frequencies. Um, you're hearing a lot of robotic voices. There's a lot of displaced voices. Um, the main characters, THX and LUH, don't really talk a lot. And there's this unsettling feel that they're always being watched. Um, there are scenes where THX will go, Robert Duvall's character, and he will go to a confession, uh, standing in front of this like Jesus-like uh, portrait. You feel like there's someone behind that portrait who's watching and recording his every move. Now, this is most um, obvious in the scene where LUH and THX actually make love, because in this society, of course, sex is outlawed, and they make love, and LUH stops for a minute and warns him that she knows that they're being watched, and THX has to tell her, you're being crazy, there's no way, and then, of course, it cuts to a shot of, like, a dozen people watching them making love. It's really eerie, because it proves that even in your own home, you're not safe from public prying. Typically, with these kinds of stories, what you have is the central character figures out that something is not right in their surroundings. Um, they kind of wake up, they rebel, and then they attempt to escape. And there's a lot of films like that. Um, of course, there was 1984, which this film borrows a lot from. There was also Logan's Run, um, The Matrix owes something to this. A, a film that, sh that shares a lot of visual similarities is actually Michael Bay's The Island, the one Michael Bay film that... I don't hear a lot of people talking about it. You should check it out because that's probably Michael Bay's best film, but it, it owes a lot to THX-1138. They actually wear the same kind of white uniforms and they live in this very underground place. It's almost a remake. Anyway, that's kind of the formula that this story uh, takes. LUH and THX are, are caught uh, having sex and eventually this third character comes in, played by Donald Pleasance, who plays SEN and he comes in and tries to insert himself as THX's new roommate, trying to replace LUH. Uh, this sets up uh, where THX starts to break down on, on the job. He gets tried, and he gets sent to this detention area, which is one of my favorite set pieces in the whole film. It's not necessarily my favorite scene, because the stuff that goes on here, he basically gets surrounded by like these leftover rejects from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Everybody's insane. Donald Pleasance is talking nonsense. There's these other crazy people talking in his ear. And finally, uh, Robert Duvall's character gets fed up. And this is when he just decides to leave and go his own way. He wants to find LUH and get the hell out of Dodge. Donald Pleasant's character uh, follows him out of there, and he's still yapping on. And um, they also meet a, a hologram character, SRT, who joins them in their escape, and together they're on the run from the authorities. 
Now, there's a, a lot of visual stuff in this film. You could actually say that Lucas took a page out of the Kubrick rule book. Um, there's a lot of long corridors and hallways, and it's just a very aesthetically pleasing film to look at. There's really not a lot of camera movements, but the way Lucas places the camera, the depth of field, it feels very epic in this very self-contained world, and that's what I really appreciate it. But there's also scenes that are without context that I have no idea what they mean. You could take them out of the film and it wouldn't change the movie at all, but they're really intriguing. And the one scene that really sticks in my mind is what I've heard referred to as the freeway of life. So THX and SEN are on the run and they exit the detention hall and they emerge into this this really confined room with like hundreds of people running around all about. It's like a river. And at one point, SEN, Donald Pleasance's character, actually gets swept away by the current. You feel like it's a current of an actual river, but it's just a bunch of people going by it real fast motion. And Robert Duvall and um, SRT, the hologram character, have to kind of wriggle their way through it to get to the other side. Um, it's real intense. I've never actually understood the reasoning behind that scene, but the more I think about it, the more questions I have about it. It's really cool to watch. The chase scenes in the tunnels at the end are a real highlight. They must have been the fastest car scenes filmed at that time. THX has to man a vehicle to escape the robot cops on motorcycles, and it's a blast. It's not a very long scene. It kind of feels like it is, but it, it only lasts, I think, three minutes. But it, it's just super fast. And everyone knows, it's no secret, that Lucas was a huge car enthusiast. He was into the, like, the underground racing scene back before he even decided to be a filmmaker. And a lot of his films have that in there as inspiration. This film, um, of course, his next film after this, American Graffiti, was all about the underground racing scene. And then in the Star Wars films, even, there's a lot of really fast scenes. Whether you're talking about the speeder bike chase in Return of the Jedi, the pod race in The Phantom Menace, or the speeder scene in Attack of the Clones, he's always trying to, to put some really fast scene in a Star Wars film. But it really started right here. Now, if you really sit down and watch this film, it's not hard to understand why studios would have been a little frightened of it when it first came out in 71. Again, the narrative is not very conventional. Um, you know, it really gets you with sounds and, and the visuals, and it's more about what you feel from how you view these visuals. It's almost an experience akin to 2001. I mean, I'm not saying one film is better than the other. I'm trying not to compare the two, but at least visually... Um, they both kind of share a lot of the same ideas. And this could be really one of Lucas's, if not his, his most personal and his most complex film. It's a very important film, and its influence can be felt today even. THX 1138, as a joke, is usually um, put in a lot of the Star Wars films. Where are you taking this thing? Prisoner transfer from cell block 1138. You know how you're watching a film and at the very beginning you get that THX certified logo? Well, where do you think that came from? There's a lot of um, theories of what the name THX 1138 actually means. Um, I've heard that when you put the letters together in some of these names, they they form sounds that actually are some pro some of the traits that are appropriate for some of the characters that they're assigned to. Like THX sounds like sex. L-U-H, that sounds like love. And S-E-N, while that's obvious, that sounds like sin. But my favorite theory, I don't know if it's true or not, but apparently Lucas's phone number in college, 849-1138. The 849 having the letters T-H-X and then 1138 being the last four, four numbers of his, of his uh, phone number. Bottom line, THX 1138 isn't the most conventional film, but it's a milestone in filmmaking, especially when you consider that it came out in 71, six years before Star Wars came out. Um, it's still very visual interesting, even without a lot of the special effects that were added into the, the George Lucas director's cut, which is the version that I own, by the way. Um, but if you want to see what the man was doing before Star Wars, look no further, because the future is here.